Hi, I'm Deborah Hamilton. Welcome to my podcast, Why Do Pets Matter? Ten years ago, with my iPhone and a script, I recorded the first episode of the Ultimate Pet Resolution Summit, which chatted with experts about conflicts over animals. Our conversations were intimate, honest, and illustrated how disagreements over animals occur and how those disagreements can reshape people's lives and relationships. In November 2019, I started Why Do Pets Matter, a new podcast that continued these informative discussions. I'm so excited to have you here with me, continuing my exploration into a more meaningful conversation about why pets matter to all of us. My guests and I will share ideas, stories, and experiences straight from the heart, unscripted and holistic. From the bravest moments to the most brokenhearted, we will explore how to resolve disagreements over animals differently. One thing I know for sure is I want to have more meaningful conversations that will help all of us unlock that deeply felt human-animal bond that drives the emotions of conflict. Today, I'm so happy to have Anna Malera as my guest on Why Do Pets Matter? She's the CEO of Grace Dog Training and Behavior in Lakewood, Colorado. I have to tell you, today's discussion will blow your socks off because she really does what I do in conflict resolution. She looks at the big picture. She gives you the ability to take a step back and evaluate where you and your dog are in training and gives you these incredible tidbits on how to get the most out of your training and your relationship with your dog that builds trust and confidence. Let's go see what she has to say. Hi everyone, Deborah Hamilton, Why Do Pets Matter? The podcast. And today I'm so grateful to have Anna Malera here. She is a professional dog trainer. She has her own company, which I love, Grace Dog Training and Behavior. She is out of Lakewood, Colorado, but we've been friends for an incredible length of time. And always, always she trains with grace, the human and the animal. And so today we're going to have Anna tell us what she's been up to and how the pandemic has really affected her business and the animals that she sees coming through the door, both the dogs and the people. So Anna, thanks so much for coming here on Why Do Pets Matter? Hi, 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 hi. I'm so happy to be here. I always love seeing your beautiful face and um, uh, I love chatting about dogs. I know that's what we do all the time and we never run out of things to say. So it's real. I'm really great. <laughs> We're recording this for posterity. So we always ask our guests the first question, which is why do pets matter to you, Adam Malera? Yeah, and um, I, I, I have been answering that question year after year after year and, and the same answer comes out. Um, and so, so that <laughs> the reason I must be on, on the right track somewhere there. Um, pets matter to me. I, I, I believe that the human animal bond is, um, I, I want to say it was created, but it came about um, because we need one another. Um, I was put on this planet to help dogs get homes that didn't have any. And also um, for dogs that have homes to keep their homes. Uh, and, and so, so they, they matter for, um, uh, for our, our souls. They matter for companionship. They matter for bringing out the joy and also shifting your path. If you're having a, a crappy day and, and you get this smoochy little face all up in your grill, like, ah, oh, come on, you know, how cool is that? So no day is too bad after that. Absolutely. I want to ask you a question because I love those three reasons for why do pets matter because we really need them up in our grill. We really need them in our lives to make those days that are pretty tough better. But also, I love that you said, you know, help dogs keep their homes um, and help dogs get their homes. So now we've just survived a pandemic and I'm sure it wreaked havoc on some of your practice However, things have changed, and I'm sure you have a good read on dogs that went home because people wanted dogs as they sat home the pandemic and then recognized they had no idea what to do with either an adult dog with mischief or a young puppy who hasn't even decided what the mischief is they're going to get into because it's all new. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh they, they don't know they, they don't know yeah so so you know right off the bat the pandemic 
because it came like, boom, mad fast. And as far as, as far as the world, we were just told like, Hey, there's something going on. And we're like, uh, okay. And so I, I remember feeling like the kind of sinking in my stomach where I was like, you know, I make my living off of helping people in person. Yeah. Right. Although I was already shifting my business to serve people um, via uh, uh, video conferencing, um, video analysis, Zoom, that that kind of thing, and phone calls. Um, although I was already headed in that direction, the bulk of my business—I'd say a good ninety percent of my business—was in person. And so, so here we get this. Okay, stop seeing people and mask up and you know all this stuff. And and I'm like, oh shit. And right then, um, I had uh, I had just seen a bunch of clients that were like, "Yes, we're ready to buy," you know, a package for training to deal with this issue and deal with that issue. And then all of a sudden, they were like, "Never mind." And I was like, "Oh." Um, and 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 I'm a um, a, a well paid trainer, so it wasn't like I was just going to be missing out on a hundred bucks here and there. It was we were we we're talking about you know, yeah yeah it's pretty pretty major. And so so all of a sudden my income dropped about 75%. And I was like, oh my gosh. And thank goodness I'm at least stable enough to survive, right? Um, right. And so uh, a few weeks passed and I started getting a little antsy and I was just like, I'm not sure exactly what I should and can do. But I, I started to work, uh, you know, as soon as the pandemic hit, I started to work on let's focus more on video, um, uh, uh, how, to, how to serve people via video. But again, it was, it was, it got slow and it got dry really, really fast. Um, but then fast forward to about three weeks later, we all, of a, we all of a sudden started to see a lot more people go, well, looks like we're in this for quite a bit of time, better time. You know, this is the best time ever. They got a puppy. I'm going to be home. Right. And I'm, and I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, but. Like, yeah, just a second. Um, and with that, because this is not anything that I believe has ever really changed from my perspective. When you have, you get a dog, you train it. Right, whether you do it yourself because you know how and you've had many dogs in the in your lifetime, um, or you go to a puppy class, or you hire a trainer, or you do video online, or whatever it is that you do, you get a puppy, you got to train it. You can't just exist in the cute as much as we'd love to. We want to exist in the cute, right? They blow up. They 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 stay alive as puppies because they're so cute and adorable, and you outweigh them, so they're landing on you with both front paws. As a puppy Great Dane is much different when they land on you as an adult Great Dane. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, 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 yeah, so that, that was a big, um, a big uh, eye opener for me to see all these people just getting puppies and I'm going, they're not even wanting to train them. Oh my God. Yeah. It'll, all so, work out. it'll all work out. It'll all work out. It'll all work out. Yeah. And then, and then immediately, of course, as a dog trainer, I always, uh, you know, foreshadow, I can always see what's going to come up. And I'm like, you know, all these people are home with their dogs and, what happens when the pandemic's over? And so I'm thinking about this way back in March, you know, last year, I'm thinking, what happens when these people actually go back to work? What happens when we start to open up and we get out and get, get, get a, a it would be like only, you know, a month or two or three that we'd be home with them. But I think not only is it the new dogs that came into our life that have never had us um, leave their side, which is one yeah. thing to talk about. But even to my older dogs who had me leave their side because I was traveling and I would go out during the day to work. Now that I'm home, they've pivoted in a way. Yes. It's like, wait a minute. So it's not just the new dogs that you just acquired. Believe me when I say we who had dogs before the pandemic and stayed home with the dogs. I love those New Yorker caricatures where the dogs and the cats are sitting together going, when are they going to get out of my house? <laughs> <one day?" laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so, so, and so that to me, one of the things that I recommended, and I, and I don't know if you if you recall this, but last year when the pandemic started, actually it was just a couple of days ago that we were, we were like a, like just knee deep into the pandemic. Right. Um, I started doing a free Facebook live every day for an hour and just answering questions. And, and so, so one of the things that I kept recommending to people was, Hey, you got to put your dog in a crate, give them something to chew on when you're home, when you're going to go work in the garage, when you're going to go do some gardening, you got to put your dog 
uh, and uh, confine your dog and teach your puppy and teach your adult dog that you're not going to be there all the time, even though you are. Yeah. <laughs> or no, um, uh, you have to do you have it. To set them and, up for success, which is what you're doing. Absolutely, absolutely. And 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 one of the things that I, I try to remind families is that you can socialize a dog, and you can also unsocialize a dog. Right. And it matters like like there, it's a it's um it's a muscle. Right. It's like um right. like if you're uh, like the whole, uh, you know, fall off a bike or you get get right back on or it's just like riding a bike. You just you, you just get it uh, or you go back to it um, and that you, you can get some of it back if you've done a, enough socialization on the front end. And so so, for example, my my uh, shepherd mix, he's like a Malinois shepherd mix. Um when I got him, he was about nine weeks old and um, a fairly clean slate dog, if you want to call it that. Right. Um, but I put a lot of time and energy into making sure he was happily socialized to dogs, happily socialized to humans, and happily socialized to the world. Um, and so he's had three years of like great interactions, and he's also had a few poor interactions where a dog has actually bitten him. Yeah. Um, but because he's had all these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, event didn't change him completely. Yeah, those, those, those yucky situations just, he was like, Hey, that kind of sucked. All right. I'm over it because I've been like, my bucket has been 98, 99% full of really great experiences. Right. And so when we get a dog in a pandemic, right, we get a puppy in a pandemic and we don't do those things like go to the outside mall and meet all the people and go to puppy class and go to the park and meet the children. And we don't put those things in into their world. Um, and then we fast forward to six months later, a year later, and then we say, okay, now let's give it a try. It's a lot harder to make it happen. Not an empty bucket. They have an empty bucket. They have an empty bucket or a very low uh, bucket with very few human interactions, maybe just the humans that they have in their household. We, we see it a lot uh, too. I'll, when I talk to families, they'll say, um, oh, well, we have two other dogs. And I'm like, yeah, but your dog's only socialized to two other dogs. And they sort of attached in a pack kind of thing. And then they don't really want to let anybody else in, which exacerbates the defensive posture of the puppy coming in um, or the older dogs who are there in the house. I, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I tend to want to walk when the garbage trucks are going by because they provide such entertainment of smell, noise, people, you know, people move by this truck and it gives them a really good opportunity to, to be experiencing different smells and sights and sounds. Oh, yeah. 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 And the, you know, and, and that when, when you say that about the, uh, you know, the trash, the, 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 the garbage trucks that um, you already have established or, or sound dogs um, with a young puppy. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When, when Balder was, was little, I actually took my car to the um, uh, to get serviced and I brought him with me. And so while the car was just an hour, hour and a half in service, I was going to go ahead and walk around with him and just explore the world. And this is when I had just gotten him. We came out and immediately right there, there were the train tracks. Yep. And, and I was like, Hey, let's look at the train. And it was close enough that it was noisy, but not so close that it was scary. Right. Yeah. And I went to give him food and he's like, I cannot eat food right now. I have to watch that dangerous thing that's coming down those two rails. And, and, and so I was like, ah, oh, that's a key important factor. He won't take food. That means he's nervous enough that he won't take food. So I scooped him up and I moved away from the train tracks another, that's another about a hundred feet. And I just held him in my arms and he just had wide eyes and he was just watching. And then I gave him a piece of food and this time he took the food. So I put him in a position that he could say, ah, I see the thing. I'm safe in my mama's arms and I can have a yummy, delicious treat. And I kept giving him treats while the train passed. And that was a really wonderful experience for him. We don't want to force a dog, right? We don't want to force a dog. If I would have stayed where he was, it might not been as it might, might not have been as comfortable as when I moved away. 
it, it really helped him to have a little more space. I know that a lot of people who are listening to this are going to want to hear more about that because I totally understand why you moved back. I totally understand why it was important for him to have a treat. But explain to people who are new with new puppies or who got the wonder dog who didn't need much training, but now post COVID is um, COVID brained. I actually have one now that's COVID brained. She was wonderful pre COVID. She's 10 years old. Now she's a monster. And it's simply, I think because I didn't do what you did, which was have her feel comfortable in a situation that was uncomfortable for them or me. Yeah. The, the, so, so speaking of the comfort there are a few things that there are two gauges that I like to use. One is food. If you if you're offering a piece of yummy food to your dog, now dogs are scavengers. Dogs love to eat in general, right? If you offer a piece of food to your dog and they go, uh, uh-uh, no, thanks. Take a look at the surroundings. If a dog is happy and comfortable, they're going to eat, right? Just like us as humans, right? If we're happy and comfortable, we can eat. Right. If, if I had just been in a in a fender bender. Right. And and Deborah, you came up to me and we were like, hey, you want a piece of chocolate cake? I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? I can't eat that yeah. right now. Really not. Not. My stomach is in knots. I really can't eat right now. Exactly. I'm I'm nervous. I'm anxious. I'm upset. I'm I'm still checking my body to see if I'm broken somewhere. Uh, my adrenaline's pumping. I don't I, I can't eat food right now. And so it, it, it's the same deal for us. And so I use that as a gauge with dogs. I'll say, hey, do you want this yummy, delicious piece of food? And the dog's like, uh, uh-uh, I can't do it. All right. So that's my cue to go. All right. Can we lower the level of distractions? Can we lower the level of scary out here? Can we give ourselves some distance? Can we ask you to do something that is less difficult? All right. That's one one key. Right. So so food. If your dog can't take food, that means that the environment's a little bit too scary. And the second one is, can your dog perform a behavior that's really, really easy, like sit or give me paw, something very simple? Right. Um, If you say to your dog, Fluffy, sit and the dog's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Right. You're asking for something that's easy in a difficult environment. Right. And so that's where you go. All right. Well, I'm not going to ask him again. I'm going to help him and see and see, like, do we need to move away? Do we need to um, wait till that dog passes? Do we need to do something to soften up the environment for the dog to get it? Right. And then you wait for whatever that is that you might even see, you know, if you follow their eyes, you might see what what it is that they're watching. Right. So maybe you're trying to get them to sit at the door while you're trying to get out the front door and there's a squirrel in a tree and you're like fluffy sit. And dog's like, I've never even heard of that cue before. (laughs) I don't even know what that means when there's a squirrel right there. Right. Um, And then you wait, let's say the squirrel goes away and they're like, okay. And then you see that their eyes come back to you and you go, ah, I've got you now sit. The dog's like, oh, I can do that. Let him just say so. Right? The dog sits. You slip him a cookie. The dog ate the cookie. Cool. We're 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 golden to move on to the next thing. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you said that because as I'm sitting here thinking about all the people who have dogs now that may be a little more reactive than they would have been, yeah. um, having that permission, and you know that people really want their dogs to do everything every single time. I want them to be bomb proof, and you and I both know dogs love to please us. They want to please us more than, you know, well, some of them. I have Irish setters, so they are the Jerry Maguires of the dog world. So show them the money. But if I show them food, they would do things. But I, I want to really articulate that it's okay to take a breath. It's okay to look around and see why they're not doing what it is you're asking them to do. Um, yeah, it could be, I think it's a very important piece in the human animal bond because I, I believe we break the bond when we force the dog to do something. Yeah. Right. And so if I if I say to my dog, fluffy sit and my dog doesn't sit and I know and you're a pretty reliable <laughs> sitter, there's got to be a reason. Right. But if I if I know that the dog, if I, if I ask the dog to sit and the dog doesn't sit and then I get mad and I go, hey, you sit right now, I'm adding more stress. Right. And then the dog still doesn't do it. And then I go ahead and I push that bottom down and the dog sits down like, yeah, you know better. Right. I know he knows. Right. That's not necessarily true. Like they might know it in their head, just like I know how to eat chocolate cake. But if you're going to offer me chocolate cake, after a car accident, not happening. And I don't want it. Right. Um, and uh, or if you ask me to, you know, uh, you know, right after a, a, a fender bender, if you said, hey, could you show me how to balance a checkbook? I'm like, I know how to do it, but I, I can't even think about how to do it right now. 
right? It's a skill that I, I might have, but I can't do it in that particular situation. And so, so I think it is very important that we recognize that our partner, our dog is, is able to do the thing. And when we recognize that they're not okay in that situation and we serve them by helping them, by moving them away or lowering the distraction levels or supporting them with, you know, treats and food when they're doing something right, you're strengthening that animal human bond. And therefore your dog starts to trust you more and trust you more and trust you more. And so the bond that I created with Balder, and you know, I was so lucky to have him as a baby, baby puppy with all the knowledge that I've had for all these years of doing training, right? So I got him in what, 2017, 17, 18, something like that. So he's three and a half ish now, whatever that year is. And so when I got him, I made sure to make this connection, this connection constantly, right? So if I had him in a group of play and he got kind of clobbered by another puppy, like they're just, you know, gangbusters rolling around and everything. And then he would come up out of, out of like a pile of puppies and he'd just look up at me and I would dive in and scoop him out and go, I got you. You all right? And he's like, whew. Thanks mom. Yeah. Thanks mom. And then I go, you ready to get down? Okay. And I put him right back down again. And so somebody else might say that that's coddling, but what I'm actually doing is I'm building the connection with this dog. I'm telling him, when you feel a little bit overwhelmed, you look to me, I'll get you out of it. Right. Not suck it up, buttercup, figure it out yourself. Go kick some ass. Right. Yeah. Not what I'm telling him. I'm telling him, look to your mama. Mama's going to save you. I totally want a pansy ass dog. Yeah. Right. I want a dog that's going to be like, yeah. Right. I want to, I want a dog that's going to be like, you know, like, oh, a fight. I'm going to go that way. I'm going to go see my mom. Right. I remember, yeah. I remember, uh, you remember to, to, to Tonka, where is he over yeah. here? Tonka. Yeah. Um, to Tonka, the first time I let him off leash in a public area, and it was an off-leash um, uh, park here in Colorado. First time I let him off-leash, and this is a dog that was like, enjoyed fighting, right? <laughs> right? So I let him off, off, off-leash. off He had an incredible recall. I mean, I worked so hard with this dog, and I was like, all right, we're at a point where I'm dropping the long line, and then I'm going to let, you know, take off the long line. I had just taken off the long line, and he's all running around sniffing, and he's about, he's a good 50 feet away from me. And I see this unaltered, big Ches- Chesapeake Bay Retriever just comes up to him. And this is, you know, Tatanka, he's a little staffy, he's a little 16 incher, right? And he's he's standing there looking up at this at this um, Chesapeake Bay Retriever. And the Chesapeake Bay Retriever is like this, this like brick house, right? Just yeah. looking down at him like, he's like, you want to fight? And Tonky's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like 50 feet away and I'm like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> and I go to Tonka and he's like, but I got to go. My mom yeah. calling. <laughs> yeah, I got to go. But next time, if you're in the park, we can go, we can, you know, go to it. If my mom's not around and she doesn't help me out, you know, of course. No, but, but that, and that's the thing is we created exactly that. I wanted him to know that anybody approaches you, you feel uncomfortable, go find your mother. Your mother will always save you. And yeah. And, and we're always I, listen for your mom because your mom will give you the guidance you need. Exactly. Exactly. Go forward or step back. And that's exactly what we want to create with our animals. We don't want to create this. Um, uh, you know, we hear so many people say like, oh, they'll figure it out or, oh, let them work out the pecking order. And that's really not the case. It isn't um, it, it isn't the way it should go. They really if we're if we're having our dogs live in our homes, in our world. Yeah, we want them to check in with us and we want to support them when they need our help. Yeah, I you know, I love what you're saying, because it is all about making sure the animals have that level of trust that they know you're going to keep them safe and they have buckets of experiences which help them make good choices. There are buckets of good experiences where someone comes in like you did and helps them out. And then there are buckets of not so good experiences um, that really they learn from. And if you are really diligent, you see it happening like the train, you know, like the dog, at yeah. the leash. you know, you see it happening and you can put them in a place where they stay safe. And I think that's what your training probably helps people do both on video and in person. Yeah. You want them to build that. I know with my dogs and I know with your dogs, the ability to know 
or at least recognize when they're having a hard day. It's not all about that they give us love and affection unconditionally on our hard days, but for us to recognize that, you know, we got to give that back on their hard days. Yeah. Yeah. There are, you know, just like, just like us, they, they, they have hard days as well. Yeah. I absolutely agree. Um, the thing with dogs though, that's really pretty cool is that they don't, they choose to not hang out in the hard day. Right. <laughs> They'll, they'll find that squeaky toy that brings them out of the, you know, they'll, they'll I know. I wish I had a squeaky toy. My dog has this ugly squeaky toy that brings her joy. And I said, God, I, I hate even touching it. However, it is her, her jam. Yeah, it's her jam. Yeah. My, my, uh, my Belder carries a queen size um, blanket as his uh, whoopee. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, he's been carrying that around. And, and uh, whenever he's not looking, I throw it in the wash and, uh, and he gets it back and he's like, ah, oh, so hard to get it so stinky. Wash it. I'm like, sorry, Buttercup. <laughs> I gotta so wash it. I worked so hard. Like, my youngest son used to have a blanket like that, and every time I washed night night, he would go, "Mom, it doesn't even smell right now." And I'm like, "Yes, I know. That's the point." <laughs> That's the freaking exactly. point. So, yeah. so Anna, this this is such a wonderful discussion because we're talking about really taking the time to understand what you're seeing in your dog. And then either, as you said at the beginning, knowing what to do because you've trained dogs before, or if, if you, you know, everybody's worried now that everybody's going to return these dogs that they adopted. And, you know, there's going to be this massive drop off at the shelter. And my thought is along with your conversation um, here is that let's try to see how we can assist these people who probably never had a dog before, or maybe did many years ago. Um, uh, the guy who's Professor G, he's Galloway um, on podcasts. At the end of one of his podcasts yesterday, he said, well, you know, when I was a kid, I saw this Great Dane in the backyard of my neighbor and I was petrified of it, but they, they introduced me to it and I loved it. And so during the pandemic, I went and got a Great Dane puppy. And now my house is being consumed by the Great Dane puppy. And I've asked him to be on the podcast because He's experiencing what everybody is experiencing. And maybe I'll have the two of you on if he ever says yes. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah because, because you would say to him, listen, you wanted this dog your whole life. Your whole life you wanted a great day. And so you've got one now. But what do you do now? We all have been there. You've been there with Tonka. You've been there with the other dogs in your life. I've been there with every one of my Irish setters and long-haired dachshunds yeah. where you're like, WTF, what do I do now? They're, they've they've exhausted me. I don't yeah. know what to do. I think a lot of people are exhausted, A, from the pandemic, and B, from not knowing what to do and not knowing where to go. Yeah, yeah. The not knowing what to do is one thing. Um, and But the, the, the not knowing where to go, um, there's so much out there in the world that we get guided and pulled and pushed in all different directions. And, and you know, people talk about being, um, you know, alpha and people talk about, you know, dominance and, and uh, people talk about, oh, I don't want to just give cookies. There's all, 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 all kinds of uh, uh, ways that you can go as far as training. And when it comes down to it, my perspective on training anyone, dog, cat, uh, human, you know, anything, any, you know, yeah. lizard, I don't care what it is. If you're gonna have a relationship with another living being, do it in a way that you can both enjoy it. Right. Yeah, so love and respect, love and respect, love, trust, love and respect. Use the food, use the play, use the privileges, use the affection um, in order to build that relationship. Think about how when humans meet humans, whether you're dating someone or, or you've met a new friend, you often do it over food, right? We get together for dinner. We get together for coffee. We get together for a snack. We get together for our d'oeuvres. Yeah. Right? And then we do activities together. Right. Whether it's to go to a movie or let's go for a hike together or let's go to, you know, let's go dancing. So whatever it is that you're going to do, it's an activity that you do together. And the, the, we, we can do the same thing with our with our animals. We can say, all right, I'm going to go ahead and go to this tricks class and I'm going to go to this basic manners class and I'm going to go for a hike with my dog. And so the more things that you do, the more activities that you do and incorporate food, lace food into all of that, you're going to have really, really lovely outcomes. Yeah. Right? 
And if you don't feel like you're doing the right thing, reach out to um, someone like myself. Like you can go to uh, like AP, you, you mentioned my, my credentials earlier. So uh, APDT um, is the uh, is a professional dog, dog trainer. Dog you can find those on the internet. Yeah. Yep. And so you can go online and actually look for trainers that are um, our members there. Um, the uh, IAABC, which is the Interno- International um, what is it? International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. Um, and so, again, there, you know, the trainers are listed there. Um, there's a KPA, um, which I'm not a um, I'm not a KPA grad, but uh, um, uh, Karen Pryor Academy. They have a lot of lovely trainers as well. Um, um, so anyway, there's a whole bunch and, and you're, 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 you're welcome to reach out to me, um, uh, whether it's on Facebook or, um, or directly uh, through my website, which is gracedog.com. That's G-R-A-C-E-D-O-G.com. Um, you're welcome to ask me. I'm, I'm happy to uh, r- refer. Um, but I think that, they, that when you are looking at relationships, you have to have food and fun together. Those are the two really, really big ones. When you're feeling safe and you're feeling happy and joyful, it's easier to learn, right? For both of you. Yeah, for both of you, exactly. But if you're feeling fearful, if you're feeling the pressure, if you're getting yelled at, if you're getting physically pushed around and you feel unsafe, you're not gonna learn very easily, right? You might might learn out of fear, right? Because you don't wanna get hurt or yelled at. You wanna do the thing. That that wrong bucket being filled. Exactly. Exactly. That's actually depleting your bucket. You're absolutely yeah. right about that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, it's so important for people to understand that if they ask for a trainer or go to a trainer, first of all, and I know you're going to bear this out for me, Anna, if you don't think what they're doing is correct for your dog, Bye-bye. speak up. Speak up. Yeah. Because quite frankly, you know, there are ways to train dogs or several ways to train dogs and, and not everybody's way is correct. And so being able to understand what it is you want to get out of the training, you want a great companion who trusts you, who loves you, who you love and trust. Both yeah. of you have built this relationship um, that will really make things so much better for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the, when you're seeking a trainer, look for someone who is following the science. Um, so a science based, um, a trainer where we are, we know, and it's proven that, um, food and safety and joy actually work better for training. Um, does uh, fear, does punishment, does shock, uh, uh, hitting, choking, does that kind of thing work? It will suppress behavior, but it's not, um, uh, it, it's not a, it's not a reliable method. And it's also not a method that feels good in general, right? In, in general. To me or to the dog. Because mm-hmm. I don't feel good choking my dog and, and I don't feel good. You know, I remember when I went to obedience class way back in the 80s uh, when I had my first Irish setter, they would let us let our dogs go to the end of the leash and then whip them back so we could detach their heads from their bodies, uh, which is a is a possibility when you do that. Uh, and I always thought that that didn't make sense to me. But just so I can be completely transparent, everyone, I did it because I thought that that person knew more than me um, about training my dog. And now that I'm 30 years down the pike, and Anna will absolutely back me up on this, you know how you want to train your dog. And that's not saying that, you know, maybe that's what you want to do. And and we're not saying that, you know, that's something that we would never do. We probably wouldn't do it. But really, make sure you feel comfortable in the situation you're in, either on video or in in person um, or on Facebook lives, because a lot of trainers, including you, Anna, have had wonderful, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, discussions about how do you handle this conduct? How do you handle what's going on? Because there are YouTube videos that are out. Anna's got tons of them that are beautiful that you can go in and really specifically pick. How do I stop my dog from doing this? How do I get my dog to do that in a way that's going to have both of you enjoy the journey? Yeah. And that's, and that it always goes back to that. Enjoy it, enjoy it, have fun with it, make it so that the dogs, I mean, like I'm sitting here talking with you and both of my dogs are just laying down here because they know this is what mama likes. Right. So mom, mama's doing a, a thing on, on, um, on video here. Um, and so I've got one dog laying down next to me. I have cookies right here at my desk and periodically I give a little, a little cookie here and there. Yeah. Um, I'm not constantly feeding. This isn't a bribe. 
Um, it's it's just uh, me saying, ah, look, you're still doing the right thing. Here's you're, the still, you're still helping mama be on a Zoom without a bomb. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mike, of course, is here. You can't see him because of this Zoom screen, but he's been here um, traveling with a very fat fly. So he's been all over the house today because the fly is all over the house. So I keep hearing, <laughs> and I'm sure that it'll be in the recording. You'll hear his little feet as he comes in because the fly's in the window and then he goes out because the fly's outside. And this is so entertaining for him. And you know what? I don't mind. I figure if he's not, you know, Zoom bombing, I, I'm, I'm ahead of the game and the fly, <laughs> the fly is my food. So the last question I want to ask you, which is yeah. all something that, what if you have a dog that is not food driven? Um, uh, I've had dogs that are toy driven, um, yeah, I've had dogs yeah. that aren't food or toy driven, and then um, the hair gets ripped out of my head. <laughs> so, so as far as far as the food drive, in general, my question to my my question to that question is, well, how do you feed your dog? And I'm going to give a couple of examples. Some families will uh, free feed. So they'll leave the food out all the time. And then we say, hey, let's go ahead and use treats for training or the regular food for training. And the dog's like, yeah, no, you know what? I got my food over there. Yeah, I don't need to really work for this. So fair enough. We understand that. So at that point, I say, go ahead and pick up the food and set some times for when you're going to feed. So let's say, let's say you set the time at seven o'clock in the morning and at six o'clock at night that you say, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and do some training prior to feeding breakfast. They're hungry, right? Right. Cause they're a little more hungry. Um, and, um, and then the other, um, you know, you can do prior to breakfast or you can simply not feed from the bowl at all and use the food. So you measure out the food. Let's say your dog gets you know, two cups or three cups, three cups of food a day, right? Now you measure out that uh, three cups the night before you leave it, you know, and you got it in your treat pouch or whatever. Uh, and then you start training throughout the day. And then you get to the end of the day and you've got like a, you know, a half a cup or three quarters of a cup left over, throw that in the bowl or a toy or whatever for them to get it out. And so th that's, that's a general um, answer to that question. What if my dog isn't food motivated? The one other piece that I throw in there too is, well, what are you using for food? Right. And so if you're using something that's not really quite delicious, right, how much is your dog really going to want to work? Yeah. Right? We also have to look at um, go back to the uh, reinforcement history. What have they been reinforced with? Right. Who is your dog? Right. Who is your dog? Will your dog will your dog go Ooh, food? Right. I'm really, really full, but ooh, food. Right. And who is your dog? I have a few of those, but I don't yeah. have one now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so like my shepherd, uh, my, my shepherd Mally mix right from the beginning, he was just like, you know what? Food. I don't really care that much about it. You know, and he's on, on a raw diet and everything. I'm like, ta-da. And he's like, eh, yeah. I'll wait. And you can see his ribs too. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> I'm like, you're challenging me to do something else. So what do I use? I use high value food. Yeah. Right, which he likes to work for. Um, I also reward with tuggy. I reward with fetch. I reward with um, snowballs. Yeah. Right. Oh, so whatever, yeah. yeah. I have to adjust. I have to course correct and go, well, what do you want? And so I've figured out he likes to play with the hose. Right. So we do training and then we play with the hose and we do training and then we play with the hose. Right. Um, he likes to catch snow. So I'll make snowballs and, and throw them at him. I'll shovel and throw it in the air and he like jumps up and bites at the snow. So I have to find what's reinforcing to him. He loves to play tuggy. He loves to play fetch. So we, I have a bunch of different reinforcers that I can use with a non food motivated dog. I, I love that because that's what I've been doing with my young dog, who food is like an enigma to him. I can count his ribs as well. Um, and you're right. I've, I've tried almost everything. Uh, I haven't been successful, but I'm still in the hunt because I've fed him in the morning and then at night uh, taking his food up after about 20 minutes. And then he just doesn't eat for the rest of the day. And when he put it down at night, he goes, yeah, maybe not. And so you can count his ribs and, you know, the, the neighbors will call animal care and control and say that I'm abusive <laughs> to this dog because you can count his ribs. However, trust me, he's just a pain. And <laughs> this has been so much fun. I know we're going to get back together again yeah. and again because everybody's coming out of this with so much anxiety, I think, and so much love for the pet they either had before the pandemic or the one they got during the pandemic, and they want to live their best life. So for me, what I heard you say is that, you know, 
you need one another. And so that need for one another should have you seek out someone like Anna, who's going to help you um, keep your dog in your home, maybe get a dog for your home and build that trust and that deep bucket of good experiences, even in the face of bad experiences. What can you do to back it up, to take a breath and have a good experience when you notice your dog is having a bad experience? So today has been such so educational for me, as always, Anna, because I love you. Tell us again how they can get in touch with you if they want to check in. Um, you know so many uh, trainers that might be in their area or because of all the online stuff we're doing now, they can even avail themselves of your wonderful service. So tell them again how to get in touch with um, Anna at Grace Dog Training and Behavior. Yeah, so um, the, our website is gracedog.com. That's G-R-A-C-E-D-O-G.com. And you can just click on the uh, contact us and you'll send us an email. And that'll all be in the show notes, everyone. So don't worry if you don't have a pen, you're driving down the road. Just go to the show notes and you'll get all of Anna's connectivity because she'll be back. And we're going to talk about this because, believe me, people with the training that Anna has to help train you, train your dog, this is a, a wonderful cycle uh, that we all have to go through, whether our dogs are older, younger, new, old, because this has been such a difficult year for everyone. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. So we have to do everything we can to make it easier. You're um, welcome to uh, contact me through the website. You're also welcome to call our, our numbers 303-238-DOGS. Uh, that's 303-238-3647. Uh, and I do see people on Zoom. Uh, and um, I have clients in New York and California and Texas and Canada and Florida, uh, Chicago. So I, I, I see uh, people everywhere. Um, and um, and um, the way we work everything out on Zoom, it's really, it's effective. Um, I teach you how to set up your um, uh, camera so that I can see what you're doing. So you can show me what you're doing with your dog. Um, and then I also have my own personal dogs that I, I demo with. Um, and, uh, and on occasion, if necessary, I will go out and actually video myself doing something with my dog to send for you to um, uh, as a demo. Yeah, because uh, so you have to know good. how to do it. And it's not, yeah. you know, it's it, we have pivoted and created so many different yes. ways to have a good relationship with our dogs. So Anna, I'm so grateful you're here. And please promise to come back. I promise, I promise, I promise. <laughs> this All is right. Hamilton, Why Do Pets Matter? And until next time, give your dogs a kiss for me because they really do matter. Bye now. The Why Do Pets Matter podcast drops every Thursday and can be found on whichever platform you find your podcast. Subscribe now, invite your friends, and I cannot wait to have you join me in these conversations.